As we uh, stated earlier, our thoughts this morning are entitled Health Disruptions in Prophecy. Now, in order to uh, establish my background, first of all, I work for a major hospital chain. I've been a certified business continuity planner since 2007, which means I do disaster emergency and continuity planning for a hospital. Uh, I've been involved actually in pandemic planning since 2009. And this pandemic planning, we revolved mostly around uh, pandemic influenza, but of course the plans that we have uh, have just been converted over into the uh, SARS COVID-19. And uh, I'm also a member of the pandemic planning committee uh, for the hospital, and that's a multidisciplinary. We've got clinicals, we've got doctors, we've got emergency response people, and so forth. And what we want to do, what I want to do, is provide you some insights and perspectives, but with uh, spiritual eyesight and with through the lens of uh, prophecy. Now, uh, one of the things I'll tell you about business continuity planning is all the plans that we have require outside help. So just to give you a little background, we have a uh, tropical storm, soon to be a hurricane that's in the Gulf, and will probably hit the Gulf Corp Coast in the next few days. And the, our emergency response is all about bringing in outside help. And it's interesting, in the many years that I've been in continuity planning and spoken at conferences, I've never really heard anybody planning for global events, whether it be a super disaster like a comet or something like a worldwide pandemic that totally uh, stifles the, uh, the economy of the world. Um, but in any case, we always look for outside help. Uh, and we see that in hurricanes, they stage resources just outside the impact area and then they bring them in after the fact. The problem with a global event is there's no outside help as we found when it came to supplies like uh, N95 masks, everybody needs them and there's not enough. Now, whenever we do continuity planning, we, we build plan, plans because we, that gives us a framework to adapt versus having no plan at all. Um, I'll give you a little uh, background on what our current status is as of this week we had a hospital meeting. Our census has been down for the last two months because everyone's scared to death to go to the hospital and they've been deferring necessary things. So we're down over a billion dollars. We're trying to make up for the shortfall. Census is starting to come back. Uh, I work in IT and we've been told that we'll be a virtual workforce at least through the end of 2020. So I want to make you aware of some of the things that businesses are doing. This was not my decision, but the businesses. And they also announced that they are going to take a corporate-wide uh, review of office space and the use of offices, because now all of a sudden they realized, well, we can be virtualized. And so that will have an impact on real estate. It'll have an impact on uh, fashion and clothes because people don't dress up. It has an effect on local businesses and restaurants on commuting and the whole future of urban areas is starting to uh, be questioned anyway. So just some things we wanted to make you aware of that these are some of the impacts. Now, you know, when on January 1st, 2020, we all looked towards uh, a, a new year. We reflected in our watch night service back on, the, on 2019 and we ushered in 2020. And who would have thought that January 1st was the good old days. But in fact, that's our perspective right now. And the question we've got is what's gonna be the new normal? Well, you've heard that expression and that's what we really gotta to, to look at. And so we're gonna look at some of the uh, health indicators and try to help you understand what's happening. And also, once again, provide you a perspective of some things that may be important that are uh, not being said. Now, in business continuity, one of the things that we have is called crisis communication. And crisis communication, uh, we uh, basically, um, we, we craft messages 
and we control the flow of information. So there are things that uh, continuity planners are planning for right now that they're not talking about. And I'll give you the example. Six weeks ago, when I first gave my first COVID talk, uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, carriers were not even in the discussion. There's a whole bunch of stuff, second waves, things that just six weeks later are now in the dialogue. So I'm gonna to try to point some of those things out that we might be aware of. And the first thing we need to understand is what a virus is. And uh, a virus is basically, well, <laughs> it's a gray area, whether it's living or not living. And, and the reason is that uh, viruses cannot reproduce on their own. They actually need a host to reproduce. Uh, so even Scientific American was, is, is on the border as to whether viruses are living or not, or they're just a mechanism. But anyway, a virus requires a host to replicate uh, and reproduce. And that's why with a lot of these viruses, you'll see uh, coughing events, that's to expel the virus so that it can infect others so it can reproduce. And there are viruses with DNA, but most use RNA, which is a single strand of genetic material. And with RNA, you get mutations because there's not the double check of DNA. And uh, viruses tend to adapt to immune responses. And here are some of the viruses. So a really good virus is one that makes you sick, makes you uh, expel the virus so you can infect others, but doesn't kill you before you can spread the virus. And so these are some of the viruses that we've seen. Uh, that we commonly refer to. Uh, the second thing we want to talk about is novel virus. And we just add that word novel. Well, novel basically means new. So a novel virus at patient zero, patient zero probably being someone in China, there are seven and a half billion people on earth. No one has immunity to it, which means if it's highly contagious, then everyone can catch it, no one's got immunity um, to it at all. Also novel means no advanced knowledge, and this kind of explains the reason that there was, there was so much questions, you know, everyone was saying, well, why don't they have the answers? Well, nobody knows until we get some experience. So no advanced knowledge, this is also why we get so much conflicting information early on, and it's highly infect infectious. Because no one has immunity, if it has an effective uh, uh, mechanism for infecting, uh, then it spreads really quickly. And there are only four possible outcomes with this virus. This is important to understand. You either get the virus, you stay isolated, you get vaccinated, or you participate in herd immunity. So these are the four outcomes, and I'll explain that a little more. So either you get the virus or we get a collective, um, they call it herd immunity. And <laughs> we look at it as, as a herd of cattle. So we are all the cattle, no one's immune. We either get the virus or if, if a vaccine comes out, we can get vaccinated. And when enough of the herd gets immunity, then the virus dies out. Now, one important thing to, to note with this, and it, I need to stress this to all the Bible students. You need to check your sources. This is something that business continuity planners do all the time. We have to validate our sources to make sure that, the, that they are sound. And so here is a list of some of the places uh, that are credible sources. So when I see something in the news, I actually go back and validate it to one of these credible sources because there's a lot of misinformation and fake information out there. If you gargle with warm salt water, you won't get the virus. Well, that may reduce your chances. It's not clinically proven, but that's not a fact. Uh, so we need to be uh, Bible students. We need to uh, prove all things, uh, basically. And especially with this virus, there's a lot of uh, fake stuff out there. So go back and validate to the source. And you'll see in my presentation this morning that uh, we go back to the source or we'll quote where we got it from so you can validate it. Uh, another thing we've known for years in business continuity is don't trust what comes out of China. Don't trust. They 
are a communist regime, they're authoritarian, and they don't want bad news. And therefore, what they do is they edit what comes out. Um, and we've known this for years. Uh, like I said, I've been pandemic planning. So we've watched China. There was the H5N1, H7N9 virus, the H9N2 uh, virus influenzas. All of those are influenzas. And then this, this COVID-19, the COV SARS-2 virus. What we have learned in the, uh, in the pandemic community is take what China says with a grain of salt. So today, China shows about 5,000 deaths total in China. That's not even believable. And uh, one of the ways they figured out how out of scale that was is uh, one funeral home in uh, Wuhan province in one week alone received 5,000 funeral urns. So they started doing an investigation looking at uh, the ordering of funeral urns because you know they were saying, well, we have a really low death rate, but then in fact, what they found was the number of urns that was going in during the peak was about 5,000 a week into that one city. And those of course are, they cremate and then give the family the urns. So some of these leaks are, are revealing massive deaths and devastation in China and the same with Russia right now. Russia is another regime. So take those things with a grain of salt, but you can look at Italy, and Europe and the United States and other open societies and get a better idea. Unfortunately, not having good information hurts us because this is a novel virus, um, a new virus, nobody knows about it. So if we had more accurate information on the front end, it would help us in our answers and our planning. Another thing that's come up is asymptomatic and I covered this in my first talk, but it's still important to understand so what happens with an asymptomatic disease is, uh, here's the disease profile for COVID-19. So you've got an incubation period, and that's called the latent period. That's where you've been exposed, and it starts to build in your body, but you're not yet infectious. And then there's a, what we call a pre-symptomatic phase. And now we, we do now know, based on a uh, CDC study from April 1st, that Many people are for one to three days before they present symptoms, before you have the fever and the cough, they're spilling virus, which means they're pre-symptomatic. They're, they're spilling virus and they are infectious, but they're not, they don't have a temperature, they don't have a cough, they don't have a fever. So you see, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So we have a spread prior to taking your temperature. So you know, we see in all the reopenings that we're gonna take your temperature when you come in our theme park or our restaurant or our hair salon. Well, that works great as long as you're not in that one to three day period where you're pre-symptomatic. And then also on the back end, uh, the average isolation period after you stop showing symptoms is 14 days. And typically what they do now is two negative COVID tests, then you're free to go back in the population. Some people have gone up to 21 days and still be shedding virus after they're through with their, uh, their symptoms. So that's another thing. Uh, asymptomatic transmission is kind of interesting. I'm going to give you, I'm giving you uh, five different quotes here from CDC, from Journal of American Medicine, from uh, Uruguay. And what you see is uh, that there are, are pre-symptomatic clusters or pre-symptomatic people. These are people, or asymptomatic people rather, that show no signs and yet have the virus and are shedding and are infectious. And you see in Iceland, they did pretty extensive background testing. Almost 18,000 uh, people in the country showed up as positive for the virus. So they show antibodies, but 50% of those showed no symptoms at all. So the bottom line is you look at this and you got, well, a homeless shelter where of those that were shedding 100% were asymptomatic, a cruise ship were 81%, and the Wuhan analysis from the medical people in Wuhan said 42% were symptomatic. So the bottom line is there is an asymptomatic um, population that is shedding the virus right now that shows no signs. And this is a danger because it, uh, it spreads. Now, we probably won't really understand the full 
um, how fully uh, this has saturated the country until after the fact. Now, I'll give you the example. When we were looking at the West African Ebola outbreak a few years back, after the outbreak was done, they did background testing of the larger population. Call this a surveillance test. And what they found out was most people in the, in the three country region had uh, antibodies for Ebola, despite the fact that a lot of, most of them had not gotten Ebola. So they'd been exposed, exposed in low levels in their communities. Uh, and so that's, that's part of it. Now, when it comes to immunity, you know, when you have antibodies, there's a question as to how durable that is. That's called durable immunity. And the question would be, how long am I uh, going to be protected from being reinfected? And right now we know it's two or three months because it's novel. We don't know how much longer. And I'll give you another example. When it comes to the common cold, which is a virus as well, uh, your immunity is only uh, typically one to two months. Uh, so we don't know. And that's why they say just because you have antibodies doesn't mean that you can't get reinfected. We don't know yet. We haven't had enough elapsed time. And so we continue. So we're going to add in the asymptomatic carriers that are known to be out there. Uh, we don't know. And this is a danger of reintegration as well, because you can have people that are going to pass all the tests that never show symptoms and never know they had the disease and yet can be spreading it. Now, masks, remember early on in the pandemic, they said, well, don't wear masks, they don't do anything. Um, and then what later on, what they found out was, well, actually, because this is a, uh, a droplet spread uh, disease, that's the mode of, modality of transmission, that actually masks provide uh, diminished droplet uh, transmission to others. It doesn't do anything for you. And here are some typical masks. I want to show you PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. This is what clinicians wear, wear, including, you'll notice, either a face shield or goggles. And this is how, this is protection. But these masks that we have are for others. So it diminishes the uh, little droplets that we all exude, whether we're sitting there breathing, talking, singing, or coughing. Uh, it diminishes those droplets and therefore lowers the transmission. And so if you're wearing a mask, you're doing your duty to help protect others. That's how we look at it. And finally, we're gonna look at the, uh, the vaccine. And vaccines are all in the news now. And I know there's 20 companies that have promising vaccines, but typically vaccines take over 18 months to develop. And you know, some viruses, they can never develop a vaccine. Now there are prom there's a lot of promising things right now. So stay tuned. We can't make any predictions on this, but one example is there's never been a vaccine developed for the common cold. Wow. Luckily with COVID, it looks like there are a number of promising vaccines. Now, most vaccines get knocked down in the uh, clinical trials phases because they might have other side effects or uh, issues or they might not be effective, but you know, there are so many of them right now and there's so much money to be made in coming out with a vaccine that the pharmaceutical industry is very focused on this. So we are hopeful that uh, those will come to pass pretty soon, soon here. Now, herd immunity, you might've heard this statement and I'm gonna try to give you the concept of herd immunity. Um, there's different ways to do it. And the first category uh, is when no one has immunity and that kind of lets it run and burn through the herd. The second thing is if we have social distancing, uh, then that can reduce the, uh, the spread of the virus. And here is the spread. So in the let it run column, no one's got immunity. If none of us uh, isolated, this is what would happen. It basically burns through the whole herd if we don't change our behavior. In the middle area, in the 25 and 50% categories, you're seeing with uh, social distancing, we slow the spread. And slowing the spread has always been about uh, um, 
making sure we don't exceed the surge capacity of our medical system. That's what that was all about. And then if we get above, they're predicting right now, if we get above 60%, then we have herd immunity. So that so many people have immunity that it can't effectively spread anymore. Uh, it can, it's, it still can be spread, but the numbers and the success rate goes down and down until it drops off. So once again, remember the four out outcomes, get the virus, stay isolated, get vaccinated, or get herd immunity. So the high risk groups, the older, older brethren, or the older people, and I found out elderly is 65 or, or above, so I'm in that category as well. Those with uh, respiratory, heart, diabetes, and other uh, issues, the best tact for them is to stay isolated until we get a vaccine. Now, if we get a vaccine, the, the world changes because then we, you know, whoever's vaccinated will have background immunity. So that's good. And social distancing is one way of uh, doing this. We noticed that a lot of retirement communities and nursing homes are very isolated because it can be very devastating if it gets in those populations. And then ultimately 60% or above is the guess right now herd immunity kicks in and the virus dies out and we go back to the uh, brave new world. Now, the best way I can, uh, the best analogy I could think of was, you know, when no one has resistance, it's like a firestorm. And if you've ever seen a firestorm, it's, it's just flat out, uh, it, it goes, I mean, it burns and it burns everything pretty much in its path. Um, the second thing would be a forest fire, and a forest fire actually tends to stip or, uh, skip around, and a lot of times it'll burn the base and not the higher trees and so forth. So that's kind of like limited immunity. And once we get in that moderate immunity, uh, then we are, are kind of in the, uh, in the area where uh, there are flare-ups, and we work with those flare-ups. And then finally, once there's extensive immunity, the virus is probably still in the background, but as things pop up, it gets knocked down. So COVID-19 will die out when most people have immunity, either through catching the disease through, or through vaccination. Now you might ask the question, well, where are we on the spectrum uh, on this immunity thing? Well, this, uh, this diagram here in the upper left, that first, uh, diagram is herd immunity, so approximately 60% of the population. Now, New York, which has had a very effective uh, COVID um, response, 19.9% uh, of the people as of May 2nd had antibodies. So it's probably higher now, but still, there's a way, ways to go before they hit the, uh, the 60%. And then you look there from London, Madrid, and on down to uh, different areas, much lower number of infections. So the herd is still prime for, um, for reinfection. Now, you've seen all of these mortality curves, all these uh, new case curves, and all of those are based on the 1918 Spanish flu because that was the first real pandemic where we had in the United States detailed, uh, detailed record keeping. And in Philadelphia, they actually had a war drive despite the fact they had a pandemic, and so it spread like wildfire. So that's this pandemic curve. And so all of the uh, medical people are, are um, modeling their responses based on the 1918 flu. Here, uh, and so there was mass infection in Philadelphia. In New York, they, were, they implemented social distancing and shut the city down. And what you'll notice is the curve was wider but lower, and so there were many fewer deaths in New York because of the strategy. This is the strategy that most countries are adopting right now. Um, the problem is it kills your economy. And so the tendency will be what was done in St. Louis. We throttle things down, and then if we release too soon, here's what happens. You get another spike, and so in the news, this week, we're hearing about a second wave. When they're talking about a second wave, this is what we're talking about, a second wave. So what happens if we're released too soon? Well, here are the uh, graphs of various uh, states 
as of May 25th. And so what you see is a lot of the states had done pretty good on, on knocking things down, but now, uh, and if, if I had a more uh, recent one, I would show you, some of them are starting to trend back up. So this could be the second wave. Once again, until this virus burns through the herd, it's gonna be out there and we're gonna be infectious. Uh, where's it going? Here we are in the United States, and this graph is uh, current as of yesterday. And so what you see is we hit a hump in, uh, in April, and we plateaued out for a while, and now we're tending down. But all of a sudden, it's questionable whether we're about to, to start to trend up. Well, this corresponds to a lot of uh, cities and states uh, re releasing people from home quarantine, starting to open up essential businesses like tattoo parlors and nail salons. I haven't quite figured that out. We have a lot of personal contact, you know. Uh, so we could see spikes and we're seeing restaurants starting to open. Initially they use social distancing, but afterwards that kind of changes. And I know in Florida, in a couple of weeks, we're supposed to be able to go back close to capacity which means people are gonna be packed in. Uh, where this is going is there, there will likely be, although only God knows for sure, there will likely be another wave from a medical clinical standpoint. However, I want to stress the fact, and this is important, when we integrate and how we integrate is a personal choice. You know, the state that you live in can tell you that you're locked down or now you're free to go get on a plane or go in a restaurant, that's a personal decision. And we wanna give you enough understanding to understand the risks with asymptomatic carriers and with the potential. The other thing to, to stress on this is when you release the population to start reintegrating the way they've always done, the, the issue is there can be a two week to six week uh, lead time before you see the curve start to come back up. Because remember, it was one to 14 days of incubation and then a pre-symptomatic period and so on and so forth. So there's a lag here. So just because you opened up this week and you didn't see any change doesn't mean that you won't have a change in weeks three, four, five, and six. And unfortunately, because of that lag, we're making very imperfect decisions. So just to be... Uh, just to be have an understanding there. And also understand that different countries are on different cycles and with even within our country between cities and, and states and countries, we have travel now that is being lifted because we're killing the airline industry right now. Um, that's being lifted while well, we can reinfect from other sources very easily. So we could have it knocked down in New York and then Las Vegas opens up and a bunch of people are, have cabin fever, go to Las Vegas, get the virus, bring it back, and you get a resurgence in two to six weeks. So why is COVID-19 so ugly? Well, nobody has immunity, and we don't have a lot of advanced knowledge on the, uh, the characteristics and the behavior of the, of the virus. Um, so all of those things come into play. Uh, it's easily transmissible. So it transmits really pretty well between people. There have been more infectious agents, uh, but it's easily transmissible. There are a lot, we have evidence of asymptomatic carriers. So uh, as of two weeks ago, I was not an asymptomatic carrier uh, because I went and gave blood and they tested my blood and they said, you don't have any antibodies. But you know, that was two weeks ago. So if you have any outside exposure at all, you could be a carrier now. Uh, the virus is viable on hard surfaces for up to uh, nine days. That's from a BBC report. They're now, the medical community, the consensus now is that uh, surface transmission is not as, uh, as, in, as significant as we initially thought. So uh, that doesn't mean don't, that doesn't mean we can give up hand washing and not touching our faces, but it's less of a factor uh, than the uh, droplet transmission. It has a long contagious period. There's limited background testing, so we can't really evaluate who 
what percentage of the herd has been affected already uh, because we don't have extensive background testing. There's no approved treatment protocols. There are some promising therapies with, uh, with uh, plasma and other things, but there's no, uh, there's no Tamiflu like we have with normal influenza to treat people. Uh, and we could have possible multiple waves. And that's the other thing that maybe the medical community is not saying is it could be, instead of a new wave, it could be new waves, plural. And it's probably gonna be 18 months to a vaccine. So it could be next summer, it could be 2021. We don't know. Only God knows for sure. And you know we can take uh, assurance from that. So enough of the, uh, <laughs> the pandemic stuff and the virus stuff. Uh, this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, healthcare crisis. It's the worst healthcare crisis in 102 years uh, since the uh, Spanish flu. So uh, this is very important to understand. Let's, uh, let's get into the spiritual perspective because, you know, Hopefully we've just given you some perspective of things that are happening and things that may be coming. And one of the things we find out in contingency planning is training and setting expectations really helps us with dealing with uh, issues. So it really helps us understand uh, where we are and not to be anxious. And the other thing that really helps us is, is the scriptures like Isaiah 55.1. Uh, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return unto me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And what God is saying is God has a plan. And guess what? That plan is going to be fulfilled, period. It's going to be fulfilled completely. Uh, and his plan is perfect. Now, I'll tell you, in continuity planning, we do plans and they are completely imperfect. But as we found, an imperfect plan is better than no plan. And so we adapt. We adapt to the, uh, the, the new circumstances that we see. But God can see the end from the beginning. And so his plan is perfect. And boy, that gives me assurance. That gives me peace and comfort. So everything that happens is part of God's plan everything that happens. So whether we're upset about a political outcome or economic outcome or this health crisis, this is a critical part of God's plan and God's plan is perfect. And our faith says, okay, I'm okay with what's happening. It's something that is part of God's plan and it's necessary. Now, does God cause disease? You know, in Genesis 3, 17 and 19, it says, Thou shalt not eat of it, for cursed, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So there was a curse put on the ground. And it was done, what? Because God caused it? No, it was because of the sake of sin. And in Ecclesiastes 5, 7, we read, all his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath in his sickness. Now, viruses and bacteria and all these other things are a critical part of sickness. And so it's saying part of this curse was that he would eat in darkness and sorrow and a lot of the wrath and sickness would be a result of this Adamic sin. So, you know, as we go out and talk to other people and we witness, you know, the, the statement is, how can God let this happen? And we have the answer. It's a result of Adamic sin. Sickness is a result of the Adamic curse. You've got an answer that the world is searching for. And by the way, when you give them this answer, they might say, what? What are you talking about? That opens up a door where we can witness. You know, in Revelation 21, four, we kind of have an affirmation. We see the other side of this, the end of sickness and sorrow and crying. And it says, for the former things are passed away. How much death, sorrow, crying, and pain 
have been caused by things like the diseases that we see today. But you know, one of the things that allows us to look at this in a uh, positive mode is we've got a, a God's plan perspective. We've got God's plan in the back of our minds and we realize there's a hope, a hope for a time when these are things of the past, these are memories to let mankind know the exceeding sinfulness of sin. So disease will be eliminated. That's another wonderful thing to be able to tell people. God does not cause evil. He permits it. The cause of disease and sorrow and sickness was the Adamic curse. So why is this happening? Well, in Nahum 2.3, there's a statement, the chariots shall be of flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. Brethren, this day of preparation is the day in which we live. It's the day in which we are privileged to see God's plan unfolding before our very eyes. You know, the pastor had something to say about this, and this was on page 759 in the question book on the day of preparation. And, and the question is, what is the meaning of the expression day of his preparation? And his answer was interesting. Many of the prophecies the, the Bible relate to the last times or last days, not of the planet on which we dwell, for the earth abideth forever, but rather of his present evil world or disposition, when a new age or order of things would be ushered in. Thus, the day of his preparation would be the day or period when the Lord would prepare or make ready the elements and conditions for the new dispensation. Now you want spiritual eyesight. This is it. It's the, it's the period when the Lord would prepare or make ready the elements and conditions for the new dispensation. That's it. Some alluded to it as a golden age of prophecy. This is a golden age in which we live. As a matter of fact, we are not living are we not living in a period of transition? And then look at his statement. Marvelous changes are being wrought. Old things are passing away and new conditions are being developed. See what I mean about spiritual eyesight? So the question is, are these dreaded changes or marvelous changes? You know, when I get up in the morning and I think about all of the things going on in the world, there's some dread there. But this is really saying, no, I understand that's, that's the flesh, but these are marvelous changes. These are necessary changes, aren't they? So our, we are witnessing the destruction of the systems of this world, and that is marvelous. That makes way for God's kingdom. Now, could it be worse? Well, it definitely could be worse. The estimated the bubonic plague killed 200 million, smallpox 56 million, Spanish flu 102 years ago 40 to 50 million, although there wasn't good record keeping, so it actually may have been much higher. The plague of Justinian was 30 to 50 million, and as of yesterday, COVID-19, the world death toll was about 395,000. Now, once again, we don't know the true figures from, uh, from uh, China. Continuing. So why all the focus on COVID-19? And, and, you know, it's come down to a, uh, to a balance between economics and death. Uh, that, that's what it's come down to. And that's why we're reopening, because we're killing our economies and we're going to collapse the world. Uh, so what I did here is we've got uh, annual death tolls, and this is as of yesterday, of COVID-19 versus all the other diseases and, uh, and issues in the United States. And so what you see is COVID-19 is still small. It pales in comparison to, to cancer and heart disease, doesn't it? 
And so why all the focus on uh, COVID-19? That's the question. And some of the politicians have brought this up. So, you know, it's over 100,000. It's almost 110,000 people so far. And once again, we may have another 12 to 18 months. We don't know. Only God knows for sure. So is this the final spasm? Well, in John 9, 4, we have an indication that uh, of the urgency which we should have. I must work the works of him that has set me while it is day. The night cometh in which no man can do no can, can work. Well, we can still work. We are still meeting together. We are still witnessing and so on and so forth. So we don't think, at least this would be my thoughts, we don't think this has yet come to pass. There's a period in the future where it says, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. And I think that's that dark day when all of these things start to shut down. So it appears as though the final spasm is yet future. So we add to this, this is a spasm in the time of trouble and it's a necessary part of the tearing down. Um, so part of the problem with this pandemic popping up very inconveniently is that uh, basically it's disrupting all the systems, right? Now, why is it disrupting the social, political, financial, and religious systems? Well, it's because they're out of harmony with God. They're out of harmony with God. And it kind of reminds me of the scripture, be still and know that I am God. You know, we were just tooling along, record low unemployment, prosperity, at least in the United States and North America. Uh, everything was good on January 1st. And who would have thought two months later we would be in a major upheaval in the world? And it's because these systems are not in harmony with God. Now there's a saying, time is money, and this is really the source of disruption here. So if we didn't have usury where we had to pay our bills on time or pay interest and those kinds of things, then this would be not an issue, but that's the basis of our world. My retirement and your retirement is based on your money being invested somewhere, and getting a return on that investment. But when some event like this happens that stops the, the world for a couple of months, then we have an issue. And once again, the financial systems are out of harmony with God. So how are we doing? That's the question. Um, well, many have lost their jobs, their money, their homes those kinds of things. The social and moral fabric is crumbling. And you know, when I, when I did this presentation, uh, of course it was prior to, uh, to all of the things that are happening in the news this week, literally. The, uh, the social fabric is just being rent. And it's amazing to see how, uh, you know, one police death, which we're not minimizing, has caused a whole social movement. And now, so there's all sorts of forces that are coming out. And in the United States alone, there was over 200 cities where there were demonstrations this week. Uh, so it's not just the big metro areas. So this is a whole social movement and we're watching it. It is marvelous. We are watching it right before our eyes. The call for justice, the call for uh, fairness, and so on and so forth. And people are losing confidence in their governments. You know, I heard this week that uh, even Putin, his popularity is suffering in Russia because they're having a big COVID outbreak. And uh, social media lets the Russians know that in the rest of the world, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, that there's a social safety net and that they're helping the people. And they're now asking, why is that not the case in, in, uh, the Soviet, in uh, Russia? And what we find is churches simply don't have the answers. 
what would you expect in this present evil world? This is exactly what you'd expect. But look at it from this standpoint. These are opportunities. These are opportunities. And when we look at it that, we can start to look at what's happening, step back, and then start to formulate a plan as to how we can witness to God's glorious plan of the ages. So we add, the systems of this world are out of harmony with God. They are unrighteous. They are not just. So, you know, when we talk about COVID-19, the two questions that probably come up the most is, how will this affect me? And when will things return to normal? I'm going to say maybe that's not the right perspective. And, you know, this is why we get together to motivate each other and to, to question not only our own motives, but, you know, to pose these questions to others as well. How does this fit into God's plan? That's what we should be asking. That should be our focus as we watch the news and as we carry on dialogues with others. Now, people are really stressed right now. And there's two things you find out when you're stressed. You're kind of like a tube of toothpaste. And the first thing is we don't always like what we see when we're squeezed. I can say this in my personal life. When we are stressed, what comes out? You say, well, that's not me. No, that is you. That's what's inside. And that's what we have to work on. And the second thing is, once it's out, you can't put it back in. So uh, people are under stress. We're under stress and the world's under stress. If we're to be sympathetic high priests, we should be considerate and patient with each other as well as the world. So what's our reaction to all of this? You know, I've seen the, there's two reactions. There's the self-centered doomsday bunker scenario that hoards the toilet paper and goes in their bunker so they won't get the disease and locks the door. And then there's the selfless reaction. How can we assist others? How can we reach out to others? What, are, what can we do? And you know, having the perspective of God's plan gives us a real, real ability to understand future conditions that are coming. We don't know the specifics, but we know that there'll be a collapse of all of these systems and to start to formulate ways we can help others in ways we um, can, can witness to others as well. So the first key is you've got to embrace the new normal. This is the new normal. And I've heard some say, well, we'll resume meetings when things return to normal. Luckily, I haven't heard that much. Instead, we seem to be flocking to uh, Zoom and other uh, video conferencing software so that we can continue to meet together. And that's great. Because Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So God provides these circumstances and luckily with things like uh, the pandemic, we have this electronic media where we can carry on conferences just like this, and then we partake. So we should not fight it and say, oh, I'm not going to go back to meeting until everything's back to normal, rather than saying, well, I'm going to adapt. I'm going to use uh, you know, electronic media so we can continue to meet together as well. And we say, wait on the Lord, uh, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. And I say again, wait on the Lord. That's really our focus, isn't it? Wait on the Lord. So the Lord has permitted these circumstances. Don't fight it. You don't have to like it, but don't fight it. And he will strengthen your heart. That's really what we want. So this is a test for the elect. It's a test for us. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> these are the events that we're being tested by that are tailored to our personal needs and they strengthen our faith. You know, the disease may persist until we have a vaccine and all we can say is only God knows the future. We cannot say with certainty, but you know, we should be okay with that. The financial crisis has just been tremendous 
as a result of this. It mandated isolation, economic shutdown, unemployment claims in the U.S. at uh, close to Great Depression levels. And we noted that this week they went down slightly, but that's because they're reopening things. Uh, it's estimated that up to 30% of the people that have been laid off may never have, those jobs may not exist in the future. Because another thing that's happening during isolations is businesses are realizing they can get by with fewer people. The social safety net is broken. There's massive debt and there's a fear of long-term uh, uh, bankruptcies, both the corporate and individual. Spending has been frozen. Most people are not spending money because of the high degree of uncertainty and that kills the economy. And businesses are failing. J.C. Penney's filing for bankruptcy. It's estimated that one third of all restaurants will not reopen. So tremendous potential there for financial disaster. The markets are, well, they're all over the place, but in a general decline. And we call that distress with perplexity. So this is an important event in God's plan. This is not just an, a mistake. God knows the end from the beginning. And this is part of his plan. So we need to watch and wait. End time prophecies. Are there any end time prophecies that point to major economic downturn? Well, that's what you're gonna hear for the rest of this conference. I'm gonna highlight just a few. And we wanna stress that we are students of prophecies. We are not prophets. So we'll point out some things for your consideration. We're not dogmatic on them, but we, we see them coming. And only God knows for sure. The first thing is when we look at the sixth plague and the sixth vial, so we look at the sixth plague in Exodus and the sixth vial in Revelation, we've got a correspondency here. And uh, Brother Jim is gonna talk on this in some detail and show you the correlation. I'm just gonna touch the fact that it talks about the water thereof being dried up that was in the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And um, we think this is a financial, a big financial decline, if not worldwide um, re uh, recession or worse. And today, this week on the news, I heard for the first time one of the economists predicting that the world economy will not recover until 2029 from this economic hole. Because what's happened is we've, uh, GDP is down, so we were supposed to have two or two and a half percent growth this year. We're down seven and a half percent because of the inactivity. We don't know how quickly we can restart and how much we'll lose there. So this is gonna have a uh, long-term effect. and return to normal but will probably not be normal. Uh, another prophecy you might wanna look at is in Deuteronomy 30 verse three. And this is talking about the regathering from all nations whether the Lord has sent them. And this of course is the regathering of the Jews. Well, today there are 5.7 million Jews in the United States, second only to Israel, 6.7 million. Once again, Brother Rick's going to talk about some of the social impacts. But what we see is that there's a lot of anti-Semitism growing in the United States and, the, and with the economic uncertainty among the Jews, there is discussion about returning to Israel. So this would fulfill this scripture where they come from all nations if we get a large exodus of Jews from the U.S. to Israel. Only God knows for sure. So will economic and anti-Semitism drive out the Jews? God knows for sure. Another thing that's supposed to happen is all of her lovers will leave her. So this is when Israel loses all of her allies. And uh, it said that it will make Jerusalem or Israel a burdensome stone for all people that burn themselves shall be cut into pieces. And so once again, what causes the U.S., their major ally at this time, to abandon or be unable to help Israel. Only God knows for sure. 
Another thing that happens in Ezekiel 38, we're just going over these lightly, they'll go, be gone over in more detail, most likely. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, this is the trading nations, and all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, art thou come down to take a spoil? So why are the merchants powerless against Gog? And you know, when you read in many commentaries, these merchants are the, uh, the trading nations of the West. So why are they powerless to uh, intervene? So do these prophesy a financial downturn? Uh, you know, they all have that, that uh, connotation. But once again, only God knows for sure. So we're going to look at those uh, and continue to discuss those uh, for the rest of the day, really. So COVID-19 could be the unexpected catalyst for a global economic downturn, recession, or even worldwide depression. And who would have thought on January 1st that we would be facing this six months later? So what's our advice? What should we do? Well, we should focus on God's plan, trust in God, know that he directs our paths, know that we grow in difficult trials, and meet and support one another, and then be a witness and a comfort to all. These are the things. So we need to have an action plan. These are some of the points we can uh, use. Uh, we understand that change causes stress, that tube of toothpaste, but uh, it is difficult to experience decline like we're seeing. But you know, as we go through and as we have successes and failures, Failures are an important part of growth if we learn from them. And one of the things I will say, there's gonna be different variations of this, is we should live below your means. Don't overspend, underspend, save. And uh, another point is that reintegration into the, uh, into the social structures, going to restaurants, getting on planes, all of these things are a personal decision. It matters not what the states say. If they lift restrictions, you do not have to go and sit in a congested restaurant. You do not have to get on a plane. These are personal decisions. And use your personal uh, best, uh, best information and your personal judgment. And finally, we should have acts of kindness to all. You know, the only solution to God's plan it, to all, the only solution to all the world's problems is God's plan, period. We understand that, and we're seeing that being implemented before our eyes. And so we need to wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen our hearts. This is the promise from God, and we need to lean on this promise. We are in terrible and wonderful times, but be of good courage and God will strengthen our hearts. This is God's time, not our time. And we can continue by saying, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. We should not be fearful. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank our Heavenly Father, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.